the webinar series. These series uh, evolved from sessions that were held by the PTLs regarding updates to their projects at each summit. We converted them into webinars to extend the reach of these events beyond the summit. Today our PTLs are going to update you on what may be new for Juno, as well as detail any other items of note for users and operators. So we're joined today by David Lyle with Dashboard and Kyle Mestri with Networking. David is going to present first and then Kyle. So David, let me put your presentation, presentation mode. And there you go, when you're ready. Excellent. Thanks for the introduction. Yes, so I'm David Lyle. I'm the Horizon Program PTO. And uh, today I'll just give you a little bit of an update on what we're looking at uh, for features for Juno. Uh, first, I want to start out with, so recently inside OpenStack we've tried to get uh, all the projects to be a little bit more unified on um, now we represent ourselves in, in, in details about it. One of, the, one of those items of consistency is having a mission statement for each uh, program. So uh, just wanted to start out with the one for the dashboard program. Um, and, and here it is to, you know, to provide an extensible unified web-based user interface for all integrated OpenStack services. So one of our, I mean, uh, yeah, one of our key goals is extensibility. Um, we realize that whatever we deliver in OpenStack Dashboard is not going to be enough um, for most operators out there. It's, it's good for a proof of concept platform, but there's going to be um, you know, either proprietary features or extensions that people want to load in. Um, if you're running a public cloud, you're going to need something about billing. You're going to need um, a lot of different uh, some monitoring, that sort of thing. So um, one of our primary goals is, is making the dashboard extensible so that uh, companies that pull it down and want to use it can add those extensions and those, those modifications, do a little bit of branding as well um, to provide, provide that user interface that will work for them. Um, I also want to point out that we, it's a unified web base. So the unified part is saying that uh, really we don't want a bunch of disparate user interfaces across OpenStack. We're trying to, to have the services managed in, in a singular um, graphical user interface. Obviously, the CLIs also exist, uh, and the APIs are available. But as far as the graphical user interface, um, we want them to be in, in one uh, unified piece of software. Um, and then the last piece is where we're su supporting all integrated OpenStack services. So um, there's different stages in the life cycle, obviously, of being becoming part of OpenStack. And um, we don't pull them into the dash, pull these or support the services in the dashboard until they are integrated. But at that point, we, we uh, definitely do want to have support for them in Horizon. Uh, and along those lines, so one of the uh, key features for Juno is uh, Sahara, the project has uh, uh, completed incubation and, and graduated and become part of OpenStack. And so we want to integrate. Uh, a lot of the great work that uh, the Sahara team has done on um, uh, Horizon component uh, into, into Horizon proper. So they developed it alongside of Horizon, and right now we're in the process of, of pulling um, support, this support for Sahara in. So you can manage your Hadoop clusters um, from Horizon and OpenStack. Uh, so that's slated to be uh, here in Juno pretty quickly. So uh, then another large item that we're trying to uh, that we're working towards is a richer user experience. So we have a, a large amount of API support, but we really want to get uh, we want to focus back on making that API support usable. Uh, and so there's some areas we're concentrating on. Um, for most users of, of OpenStack or Horizon, the primary use case is I want to launch an instance. Um, right now, the workflow to do that inside of Horizon is a bit cumbersome, um, and you have to have some knowledge beforehand to, to be able to complete that task. Uh, so we're taking a critical look at that. Uh, we have been over the past, um, I'd say, six months. We did we actually did some usability studies that were uh, presented at the at the OpenStack Summit uh, to f uh, find find the pain points there, and we're going to uh, you know rework that 
interface to allow users to more easily uh, be able to get their instances up and going. Um, there's some other things that we want to add in for user experience. Uh, one of them is a richer filtering, um, so do more API side filtering. Uh, this becomes a lot. Uh, this becomes a mandatory for anybody who has a larger installation or for admins. Um, being able to find the information they're looking for in Horizon right now is is somewhat hit or miss. We want to get that unified and and, and provide that to admin users. Um, pagination is also somewhat hit or miss, uh, so we want to get that unified inside of Horizon as well. Um, again, to support those larger scale installations. Um, validation, so we want to be able to do more um, input validation on uh, say, uh, for forms when you're trying to update items in, in Horizon. Uh, so we want to be able to provide some client side validation for that uh, to give user better better feedback and quicker feedback without having to make round trips to the server to figure that out. And then the last item here that it's not listed, but um, we also want to focus on accessibility. So we really want to make Horizon a product that that companies can pull down and use. And so one of those, one item there that is some is lacking in Horizon right now is accessibility for uh, screen readers, um, and I, that's the big thing right now. So we want to be able to support um, we want to be able to support screen readers out of the box and allow a, a, you know there there are restrictions on um, web software that certain companies can't use it if it, it doesn't support those requirements. So over the past uh, two releases, we've been working on role-based access control support inside of Horizons. Um, Horizon, uh, from early on, has supported uh, basically two roles inside of the OpenStack member and admin, and and that's it. Those are the two those are the two user roles that you could have. Um, we've been we over the past couple of releases, we put in a policy engine inside of Horizon, and then we've started uh, rolling that. Implement, implementation into the different panels and, and uh, tables that we have inside Horizon. And this release, we're trying to take the final step where we can actually turn that on and allow um, more diverse roles um, going forward, and also trying to consolidate some of the views so that it uses that role-based access control to, to show you what controls you have uh, that you can use and hide the ones that you don't have access to. Um, and an ongoing effort in, in Horizon is to increase the API coverage. So we have uh, we cover a lot of the APIs from the different services, but the services are always moving forward, and that's that's great. Um, obviously, it makes our job challenging to try and keep up. And so, as we move forward, we're going to try and increase some more of that. And we have uh, blueprints to cover um, many features that is say in, in Trove that weren't that were added in Juno but we don't have support for them in Horizon yet. Um Cinder's another big area that we want to that we have a lot of blueprints to focus on that API disparity. Um, and then across the other services as well. We we have we have a lot of work out there to do and a lot of and a lot of uh, great people picking it up and, and contributing to Horizon. So behind the scenes uh, we're also doing a, a Bit of a retooling. We're going to we're going to split our repository. Um, so right now we basically have a toolkit inside of OpenStack, and we have the main application. Um, that causes us some issues, and uh, so we're going to split that out. And the other benefit of that is um, a lot of people like to use the toolkit by itself to build uh, web applications or uh, future dashboard elements that that would come into Horizon as as they come out of incubation. Um, so th this will this will aid that process going forward. They won't have to pull down a, an application and a toolkit to, to be able to do that development. Um, it also helps Infra because uh, Horizon is kind of a, a weird case right now that doesn't fit the mold. Um, so this is a lot of behind the scenes work, but uh, we're, we're, it's, a, it's a big priority for us to tackle in this release. We're also working on an integration test suite. So. Horizon isn't as tied into uh, it's tied into the gate um, like all the other services, uh, the, the gating mechanism for code to merge. But it's not it doesn't have much in the Tempest test suite right now. So we're working on a set of uh, 
last release, we added an integration test harness inside of Horizon, and now we're adding, we're trying to build out that test suite and get it stabilized to, uh, to the point where we can get it included in, in to the automated test runs. And that's all I have for you today. Great, thank you. Let's see, does anyone have any questions? Have to go look to see. Not yet. Okay. All right. Let's go over to Kyle then. Thank you, David. And then we'll see if we have any at the end. Okay, Kyle. So when you're ready, all set. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, good afternoon or morning or evening, wherever wherever everyone is. Uh, my name is Kyle Mestry, and I'm the networking PTL in, in OpenStack now. So I, these, I think we'll just do the similar thing that David did, basically go over some updates for OpenStack networking for Juno. And like David did, I think a good place to start is, is with the mission statement um, that each of the projects have. So for networking, this, this, is, our, this, is, our impl um, this is our mission statement. Um, and one of the things that we've done in networking to, to kind of achieve this is, you know, Neutron is, is a pluggable interface pretty much up and down through everything. So all of this is implemented through, through plugins and drivers as well, both in tree and out of tree as well. Um, and that's one of the things that's served us pretty well. We have a large, large number of plugins, both core plugins, ML2 mechanism drivers, service plugins for the different services we have as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually served us uh, as a project pretty well. So I, I thought what I would start with for people here is, is to note that, that we do, one of the things I did after the Juno Summit was come up with a project plan. When, when we were in Atlanta for the Juno Summit, we, we as a project you know, had, had two and a half days of design summit sessions. And after that, um, one of the things I really wanted to capture was the high-level community, the tasks that were important for the upstream Neutron project. Um, these, were, these were the items that, that I felt should be captured in a project plan um, and documented so that people had some visibility into where some of these things were going to land in the, the milestone releases, Juno 1, Juno 2, and Juno 3, and w which would ultimately be in the release. Um, and, and I think most importantly it was this has really helped us um, as we interact with uh, distributions, um, with, with the people who are going to consume the upstream release and, and um, distribute it, um, whether that's Red Hat, Canonical, Mirantis, Rackspace, whoever else is, is doing that. Um, this, has given, this has really helped them, I think, by giving them some visibility into when things should land and things like that. So I think um, I've been pretty, pretty happy with this, and I think that I've gotten some good feedback from others. So, there's a link in here in the slide if people want to go take a, a look. Be because what I've tried to do in this presentation is highlight some of the bigger ticket items. There's a lot of littler, smaller items that are in this project plan as well. So let's, let's jump right into you know, what we're doing for Juno. This, th this was the number one item that, that Neutron has taken on, um, is, is achieving parity with Nova Network. And, um, we, we did a lot of work as a team in Icehouse to lay the groundwork for this, um, and we're still, we're still finishing this off in, in Juno at this point. We're gonna, the plan is to, is to officially close the gap with this and to move forward um, here. Uh, you know, we, had, we have a, a plan that's been blessed by the, the TC as well that we're working on as well. Um, a lot of people are focused on this, and this covers everything from um, database migration stuff to migrating from Nova Network to Neutron to implementing um, Nova multi-host mode and things like that. I think one of the, the big things that we're looking to do here is to start off with a migration script which will allow existing installations um, running perhaps Icehouse with Nova Network to be able to migrate to, to an equivalent Neutron um, functionality for Juno during that upgrade process. And that's something that we're working on now. Um, we don't have any, any sort of scale numbers at this point as to what we're going to be able to support there, but it's, it's something we're very actively working on right now. So 
Um, the other main item that, that, uh, that we're working on for this is uh, actually on the next slide. Um, so, yeah, distributed virtual router. This is, <clears throat> this is the feature that will um, allow us to implement um, the Nova multi-house mode. And so what this does is this is going to implement L3 routing across the compute nodes for, for the east-west traffic there. It's, it's also going to it's also going to implement um, floating IP namespaces per compute node as well. So for those features, you will no longer have to send traffic to network nodes. Um, you'll be able to do this on a ho per host basis. This this is the equivalent of what Nova Network Multi-Host mode was doing as well. It's it's worth noting as I as the third bullet says that um, the SNAT traffic is going to remain centralized. But there's there's another feature and. and the only reason that that's the case right now is because that's going to be a further improvement post Juno to try to distribute the SNAT functionality as well. The problem with doing that right now is the, the amount of uh, IPs you have to burn on those public networks for that. Um, so that, that's something that we're looking at doing post Juno. We, we are going to improve the situation around the network node um, with regards to HA by there is some work going on to, to implement HA for the network nodes um, using a VRRP as well. So this, um, like I said, this is uh, another big item with this has been, has been testing this functionality. Right now in the, in the gate when commits are pushed up, there, there's, no multi, there's no multi host testing that goes on for those types of commits. Um, for something like DVR, the functionality to be able to, to test commits with multi, multiple nodes is, is actually pretty useful. So that's, there, there is some work going on to explore that functionality and see if we can implement that um, in the gate as well. Um, besides that, um, there's a lot of organizations that have volunteered to help test this DVR functionality at, uh, at scale, and so we're working, we're working around that to, to ensure that we have this tested as well. So um, the next slide here is, uh, is around DB updates and migrations. Um, this is also something we are going to, to fix uh, in Juno and address. The, the problem we had beforehand was um, it turns out that our database migrations were not item potent such that they were dependent on the plugins and the service plugins that you had implemented in your installation. So we're actually going to implement a healing migration in Juno, and from Juno forward, um, all of the migrations will include all the tables for all the plugins and service plugins and such. Um, this will provide a much more consistent experience for operators as well um, and should make things much easier um, if, if installations end up changing, changing plugins or adding plugins or you know, mechanism drivers or service plugins or things like that. So I think this is, a, this is something really useful for that. Another, th this has also been uh, a big focus for Neutron, third, third party testing and CI infrastructures. And this really started in, ICE, in the ICE House timeframe as well. Um, and there's a little bit of history behind this. Um, uh, you know, when, when Neutron uh, was first started, back when it was known as Quantum, we, we originally <clears throat> had a small number of plugins upstream. And the requirement was typically, you know, a plugin would have a core developer upstream as well, kind of shepherding it, in addition to working on community features and the rest of the code. Um, that that didn't scale as well because it was hard to find um, that many core developers that fast. We ended up with a deluge of plugins, and so that didn't quite work. So in IceHouse, what we did was we we started to mandate third-party CI testing, and we put in place some requirements around it. Um, most people got the CI systems up and running. And what we're doing in Juno is we're actually continuing that by, by trying to come up with more consistent experience for developers. And, and by developers, I mean people who are submitting patches, possibly see them fail on other third-party CI systems. Uh, we're trying to come up, make sure that people are following a consistent uh, way of using the, the tools around this so that developers have an easier time to look at failures there as well. And it also, um, the other nice thing about all of this is it provides uh, consistent testing for all of the in-tree plugins um, as well. Um, that's, that's, really, that's really what the main focus has been around here, um, is, is to try to improve uh, the quality and, and things like that. Um, what happens with Neutron is a lot of the plugins may require either some sort of hardware, which is not around, or even some sort of virtual machine to implement uh, the networking abstractions. So this, this allows uh, the vendors and even the open source plugins to, to implement that third-party testing 
uh, on their own infrastructure, um, wherever, you know, in their own lab or whatever. It's actually been pretty successful and I, you know, Neutron has the, the largest third-party CI testing setup upstream. Um, and then one other note on this, there's actually a meeting on IRC on Mondays around this where we're trying to let all of the third-party uh, plugins uh, and CI systems developers and owners exchange information, ask questions, um, and that's actually been fairly successful as well. So the, the next item I wanted to touch on was, was LBAS, or Load Balancing as a Service. Um, we, we as a Neutron team have spent a lot of time on this, um, even leading up to uh, the Juno Summit and, and post the Juno Summit. And so what the result of all this is, is that we're going to, uh, we're going to unveil um, a version 2 of the LBAS API um, in, in the Juno timeframe, a, a brand new API with a new object model. We're, we're going to, uh, we already have work underway on the API and the object model, and in addition, there's work um, to update the Intree HA proxy driver so that it will uh, reflect the new API and the new object model. I think one of the more interesting things here is that <clears throat> in addition to the Intree HA proxy driver, there's been uh, a group of companies that have um, decided they, they're going to start a new StackForge project called which they're calling Octavia, and this is going to be an operator or carrier grade implementation of, of load balancing in Neutron. Um, it's, you know, the nice thing is they've been involved with the new uh, LBAS APIs in Neutron, so they're, they're pretty excited about those, and, and by doing this Octavia project on StackForge, it, it allows them to kind of iterate at their own pace um, outside of, of Neutron, but tying themselves into the, the Neutron LBAS APIs. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see um, the result of Octavia uh, once that happens. So I also wanted to touch base on the group-based policy API work that's been going on in Neutron. Um, this, this is an API, uh, it's an extension API to Neutron, and this, this is going to provide a declarative policy-driven um, model for, for people that's really application-focused. This this work started in, at uh, the Ice House Summit in, in Hong Kong was when it was first presented. So the team's been working on, the sub-team's been working on this since then. And, um, you know, the work was, was approved for Juno and is, is ongoing right now. Um, so this is, this is something that some people have, uh, I actually won't take credit for this quote, but someone, someone mentioned that, that this could be, um, you know, Neutron's uh, porcelain APIs to go along with the plumbing APIs that exist already. So, so we'll see, but this is, uh, this is looking pretty promising and, and should be pretty exciting as well. So the next item here is something I alluded to when I was uh, talking to uh, the DVR functionality previously as well, and this is uh, HA for, for L3 routers. Um, th this is what's going to be used with the centralized um, um, SNAP functionality as well to provide redundancy for those nodes that are providing that. But even outside of that, for people that don't want to use the DVR functionality, um, this will provide um, HA for all of their, their L3 routing uh, nodes as well. Um, <clears throat> this work is also scheduled for Juno right now. Um, the entry implementation is going to utilize Keep Alive D for this right now. There is a, um, a blueprint uh, filed for this right now. Um, this is also something that I think a lot of distributions are, are interested in um, in getting upstream as well. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this work um, should land in Juno and, and alleviate some of the issues with the, with the networking node being a single point of failure for a lot of operators. So one other one other note. Um, one other interesting thing from an operator perspective is the work we have in Neutron going on around flavor frameworks. And a lot of this ties back to, to services to some extent, whether that's service plugins like LBAS or VPN or firewall or something like that. <clears throat> the, the idea with the flavor framework is this is a way for that, that we're going to allow operators to offer network services to their clients and their tenants essentially. Um, we're going to try to separate uh, driver functionality and configuration from the consumers of these services as well. And additionally, we'll allow multiple backends to function here uh, as well. There, 
there's currently some discussions going around on right now around the flavor framework. There's there's a couple of different um, solutions that we're looking at trying to tie together to come up with a common one to, to have this implemented. But I think this is something that that um, the operators are are excited about. We we had a meeting with a bunch of operators in in San Antonio um, last week, and they were they were pretty excited about the flavor framework. And and I think even even the vendors have been pretty excited about this as well. It's really nice because it allows the operators to expose different functionality, different service levels, and tie it back to specific uh, back-end driver implementations as well. So, so I think this is going to be a pretty exciting thing as well. I, I thought I would, I thought I would throw um, at least a slide up about NFV as well. Um, there, there actually is a an NFV sub team or project which is um, not specifically under any sort of neutron umbrella because NFV and OpenStack encompasses more than neutron. There's also um, some things associated with Nova as well. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that that there are some people in neutron that are working with this NFV sub team as well um, on, on the different features that they want integrated in here. And obviously these would be things like service chaining, traffic steering, things like that. There are a lot of uh, proposals around this right now. There's, there's in fact some sub-teams that have been looking at service chaining and traffic steering um, for, for the last cycle. So it's hopeful that we can get some of this work merged upstream, but I, I suspect a lot of this may end up being a, a longer than Juno term type of thing. Um, this this would also include even simple things like um, VLAN trunking support um, for tenant networks as well, um, things like that. So a lot of the NFV work is we'll, we'll see what lands in the Juno timeframe, and I would expect that there'll be a, a larger push in the K timeframe as well. So the next uh, couple of slides, I wanted to highlight um, for Juno um, what new what new plugins are are either in the process of being merged or have already merged, and also what plugins are are going to be removed from upstream? So right now in the Juno timeframe, we've in Juno one we merged um, a Cisco APIC plugin and a FreeScale SDN, um, or excuse me, a Cisco APIC mechanism driver and an L3 uh, routing service plugin, and we also merged a FreeScale SDN ML2 mechanism driver as well. So those have merged. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please, we these are currently a list of of the of the existing drivers, plugins, and service or excuse me, drivers me uh, mechanism drivers, plugins, or service plugins that are also proposed at this point. So we continue to have a a, a fairly healthy ecosystem of of both vendors and open source solutions proposing uh, mechanism drivers, um, plugins, service plugins, and all of that upstream as well. Um, you know, again, I mentioned before the the third party um, CI and third-party testing has been really integral to be able to handle this type of load um, with all of these new additions coming in and things like that. Um, and we've we've tried to focus on on ensuring that as these plugins come in, we you know they they meet all of the different uh, code standards that we have upstream and, and things like that. And it's it's been really that's been a good good for us as well. And then I just wanted to highlight that in Juno, um, we're going to actually be removing the Open vSwitch and Linux Bridge plugins from the upstream source tree. Um, this this has been announced for a while. These have been deprecated for for two releases since the modular L2 or ML2 plugin um, essentially takes over for both of these. That plugin still works with the existing OVS and Linux Bridge agents at this point, um, but but the general direction has been to deprecate these and and move over to ML2 and I think as you saw on one of the other slides, there's there's a healthy bit of ML2 mechanism drivers that are also being merged upstream. So, but these will definitely be going away in Juno. So uh, that's all I had. So uh, Margie, I'll I'll pass it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's see. Any questions? I'll open up the line if someone wants to ask a question. You are now unmuted. Um, I'm going to just ask, uh, open up the question. It's kind of general. Uh, Kyle, 
I just wanted to know a little bit more about the flavor framework. It's interesting. So are you hoping to standardize around a few different sets of frameworks with some suggested SLAs and things of that nature? Or it would be kind of a, a you know, a group of, of many? So I, I think the idea is in, in, in various deployments you may have service plugins that offer different functionality. Um, you may have load balancers. You may have multiple uh, – if you use load balancer as an example, you may have um, a fancy hardware-based load balancer from A10 or Brocade or some vendor, and then you may have just HA proxy implementations that run as, as VM somewhere. So in that type of environment, you, you as the operator may want to set up flavors where tenants who want to utilize the hardware-based uh, load balancers may maybe maybe build more, and then if they're using the HA proxy based ones, they maybe build less. Um, it may be that uh, the hardware based ones are offering uh, some sort of advanced feature which not everyone needs, and that's why that's why they're you know they're going to be build more. But basically, it's a way for the operators to to uh, more tightly control access to the different um, functionality for the the different services that they're providing. Okay, that's interesting. I see. Thank you. And then, David, I know that there was a lot of interest last round with uh, Dashboard with all the changes in extensibility and um, new look and feel um, to the design. Do you, do you see a lot of that input? I, you mentioned it in your presentation, but do you see a lot of that input c coming from the uh, personas group that kind of morphed into the Horizon um, UX or, you know, from that side? And for those who don't know, there's a there's a group of people who are looking at Horizon within the OpenStack community and kind of doing testing on the dashboard side. So I was just curious if that continues to grow or where you're getting the feedback from across the board. It's not necessarily just them growing. I'm just kind of interested um, so in the evolution of that group, I guess. Right. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a subgroup of the the overall OpenStack UX effort, and we've been getting – uh, a lot of valuable input from from both those groups. Um, the personas group uh, did most of the or set up and ran most of the usability testing that we did. Um, they also ran another uh, study to try and um, determine the most common personas in, in OpenStack. And we're definitely uh, they're in the process of trying to to, to working towards finalizing um, the the output of that. And we're definitely looking to to use that as input um, as we move forward. I, but uh, a lot of the usability uh, that that we're addressing right now is, is not directly um, based on those personas. Um, I think that's going to be down the road a little bit. Uh, so we're trying to let them finalize uh, their work, and then we'll and then we'll pick that up. But that that effort is is definitely ongoing and. Um, and, and very productive, and we're, we're looking forward to being able to consume that. Okay, result. great. That's good to know. I peek in on that group from time to time, just curious. Okay. Well, does anyone else have any questions? Quiet group? Okay. Well, this session will be on uh, the Foundation's uh, YouTube account in the next few days. Uh, if you do have any questions after the fact, when the meeting is over, you'll receive uh, an email, and you can email the, us at the foundation directly, and then we can get back to David and Kyle as well. Or I think David and Kyle shared their information too, so you can contact them directly. David and Kyle, I know you're both very busy. appreciate your time. Um, and with that, I, th I think then we'll, con we'll conclude. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.